So the conversations I get from family offices and institutions, I spoke to a big, big conservative asset management firm. I spoke to their Hong Kong office and they're thinking through Bitcoin. And so I've given them the asset allocation paper that we we got at Real Vision. You know, we, we commissioned at Real Vision and said, well, here's that. And they said, that's exactly what we need. Now, can you present to this group? So I presented to that group. And then it's like, can you now present to the senior managers? Present to the senior managers. Then they need to write it all up. Then, if they say, yes, we're going to do it, how? Okay. Now, we can start with futures, which is what BlackRock are doing. Because if it's cash settled futures, I don't need to worry about the bearer asset elements. So that works. But after that, when they want to own Bitcoin, they need to get an entire new back office infrastructure. How do you price it? Nobody has consistent pricing. Nobody, you know, what time does it close and open? Where all of the things that they need just for their risk models aren't normal. So all of this needs to be built out. And you need to get approval from trustees. So this shit can be. It can take two months to get to buying futures. It can take nine months to get to actually buying Bitcoin. If you think about it, right, you're in charge of your mum's pension plan and everybody like her. What you then have to do is justify that it's safe and it's secured properly and you've done all your due diligence and and that's a lot of work because it can't be yellow, trust me. It's not Michael Saylor, you don't own the company, basically, or have all the voting rights. You have to appease millions of policyholders. So you've got a massive legal liability. So you have to do all the work. That is very important because who owns massive treasury style cash balances and long term liabilities is insurance companies and mm -hmm. assurance companies. This is exactly the kind of asset that they need. It's almost perfect for them because they have these long term cash flows and they sit on tons of bonds, tons of different currency exposures, and they need to model out the risks of that. And Bitcoin actually works really well. There's not many instruments in the kind of money market side of things that looks anything like this because bonds, you're going to get no real capital appreciation, you don't get any interest. So, how do you manage massive? pool of cash and Bitcoin becomes really interesting for them. So it, that's just a start. Once we start to see more of those, I mean, I think the whole insurance industry is going to start putting this on their balance sheet. It makes total sense. People really misunderstand what people do here. An insurance company manages a big pool of assets and then you make a claim because you crashed your car, let's say. Okay, so it comes out of the pool. So they're not going to go, oh, well, Peter's crashed his car. Shall I sell my German buns? No, they have an asset allocation. So what they do is just release some of the cash and they have cash buffers for that. So I, I don't think that changes a lot. It's going to be the guy who runs the asset allocator, the CIO, making the decisions of do we tweak our Bitcoin position by you know 15 basis points and reduce our German buns by 10 basis points, regardless of all the claims being made or whatever it may be, if it's life insurance or anything else. So again, it doesn't work in that way. So I, again, I know a lot of the story um, about this, and essentially they got a lot of flack because they're quite a conservative asset management firm. Uh, they got a lot of flack. So what they did is their 600 uh, million had doubled. So they just said, fine, we'll just put the, the original bet, take it out. We're now in for nothing, you can't complain. So it's nothing to do with, <laughs> they don't believe it. It wasn't a trade. It was like, listen, we're early. We're one of the first firms to do this. We understand that people are a little bit not sure about it. So what we'll do, we'll be in the trade for free. So that's all it was. And again, pretty clever, I think. Yes, but not this cycle. And the okay. reason being is you keep posting pictures of Lambos. And yes. I, can't, I start thinking about something, you know, work I want to do in my hat, whatever it is, right? We want to cash our crypto tokens in for lifestyle tokens. So when the, we're all value investors now, and when the value is so out of whack that you think I could sell some of that and buy a new house, and the value to you is so extreme that even though there's more upside there, the value, it's become so cheap in Bitcoin terms. So you sell your Bitcoin. Now, what usually happens is if we look at the last cycle, it went from like 200 up to 20,000. 
So I don't know what the average weighted entry price for most people was, but it was it was somewhere two thirds of the way up that rally. So, you know, what happens eventually, people start going, huh, I want, I want to buy a car, or huh, I want to go on holiday, whatever it is, right? So you start selling some, and it feeds on itself, because you're like, oh shit, I need to get my car, I don't want this to go down any further, because I planned for that. We all have hopes and dreams. So it's actually a human behavioral cycle based on where we perceive there to be value, and it turns into, oh shit, it's now become risk. I thought I was rich, and now I'm gonna be less rich. But once the institutions come in properly into this space, that goes away because of that asset allocation, um, where they tend to be buying the sell-offs. It tends to be less driven by this kind of stuff because they tend to be sellers on the way up and buyers on the way down. And that changes that dynamic. I think we're not gonna be deep enough markets by the time we get to that next tipping point because, you know, honestly, if it's up at 250,000 by the end of the year, most people want to take some profits and do something with it. Now, I know, again, it's against the philosophy of Bitcoin that this is the new future, but we live in the real world. We've got bills to pay. We've got hopes and dreams. And my personal hopes and dreams is not about the financial system. My personal hopes and dreams is about the situation I live in mm -hmm. and, you know, how my family lives. You know, you bought your dad a car. It's all the same thing. So that's why that cycle exists. Um, and it's because it's been driven from the ground up with people with hopes and dreams who are acting like value investors at the peak. Like with my Bitcoin, there's real value in property, real value in this. And that's fine. Now I've peaked at a million, but not for this cycle, but it's possible yeah. that it overshoots. So I've just used yeah. a regression line and used the trend of the log scale. And basically it says somewhere between plan B and 400,000, uh, four, yeah, 400,000, is right, but it could actually hyperextend um, to get as high as it did from trend in 2013, which will give us a million. So I think it's skewed slightly higher than people expect. I don't think it gets to a million, but we've got institutions coming in. Who knows how this dynamic changes? So I do think it's interesting. The other thing for people to bear in mind is there's a couple of price hurdles that are coming up that people haven't thought through. The first one is Coinbase's IPO. So if you are an institution who wants to buy Bitcoin and you've got to go through all this rigmarole to try and get it signed off and Coinbase IPO comes out and it's a $60 billion company and you can stick a few billion in, it's a good enough proxy for a while. So my guess is that's going to take out a lot of demand from institutions in the short term. It's not a long term thing, but it will absorb quite a lot of the demand. The next big thing after that is I think 100,000 is gonna be an issue because a lot of people got in around 10. A lot of people will have made 10 times their money and 100,000 is a round number and people think, let me take half my chips off the table. 